with this, uh, as indicated, we're uh, indeed uh, based here in uh, Yokneam. This is now a substantial uh, business. Uh, we're employing over 200 people with R&D budget of over $30 million, uh, supporting a business which is uh, uh, well over a billion dollars now. Uh, it's amazing, you know, just to uh, think about the, how small it was 15 years ago. Uh, over 150,000 carter procedures are performed uh, uh, on an annual basis. I'm going to talk about, the, and we're doing a lot of things and focus not only on atrial fibrillation, but obviously atrial fibrillation is uh, one of the most uh, important uh, challenges, very substantial uh, prevalence. Um, some of the patients are asymptomatic, respond to drugs, etc., but they're still at the end of the chain, as you see kind of here below. Uh, over 4 million patients that essentially have no solution. Only 3% are being ablated today, less than 3% of them and the challenge is how to get more of them uh, treated. Those who are being treated successfully uh, see very, very substantial benefit to quality of life. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about the, uh, um, what, you know, all the mechanism of uh, atrial fibrillation. There are people here that know better than me. And again, a lot of uh, approaches have been developed, but eventually uh, the approach is pretty uh, standard. Isolation of pulmonary veins plus additional lines plus potentially ablating at specific areas that are responsible for the maintenance of uh, atrial fibrillation. Looking at the results, and these are the results of our uh, PMA uh, study uh, that got our uh, catheter approved for treatment of paroxysmal uh, atrial fibrillation in symptomatic patients. Uh, so this was approved in the US a few years ago. And uh, these Kaplan-Meier curves look at the ablation uh, arm versus the drug arm very nice results, uh, roughly success rates in the 70 to 80 percent range for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation uh, patients. However, uh, when going and looking at the more complex patients, at persistent and long-standing persistent, the story is not as appealing. This is uh, now here from uh, uh, Mark Josephson's group at uh, Beth Israel. And here we're kind of looking at paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and all the others. Uh, so these are persistent and long-standing persistent. These are the terms that are being used today uh, in the guidelines. And the results here, this is a rather small group, but there are a lot of publications. They're all pretty similar. So this is just as an example. This is by itself a rather small study, but the results in the literature are pretty consistent with this. For paroxysmal atrial fibrillation at one year, you see the results here in the 70 to 80% range. But when you look at the non-paroxysmal patients, one year the success rates are in the 50 to 60, and then over time, the success keeps uh, going down. So this is kind of really the challenge, and there are essentially two challenges here. Uh, first is the success of non-paroxysmal patients, and the other is durability, to see that this treatment is successful long-term. I'm gonna skip uh, this and gonna go directly to, so what's next? How we continue from here? And two general hypotheses. One of them is uh, we're not ablating the right locations or the strategy where we put the lines or where we put the ablations on the right location. The other one is that we're doing it in the right location but the ablation is not effective. After all, this is not surgery. This is closed chest. You put a catheter. You think you touch. You're not sure you touch. It's not clear how effective uh, ablation is. So these kind of generally are the two issues. On the one hand, maybe we're not ablating the right location. The other one, we're ablating the right location, but we're not doing it effectively. And so one area and one direction of uh, research, and we have quite a few uh, programs on this, is to go back to EP. The procedure that I've shown you is pretty anatomical, is you know, putting lines. Some doctors are actually doing it without even looking at ECGs, right? You just put the lines, you take an anatomical map, so back to basics, back to EP, let's look at the signals, let's analyze the signals, let's understand the disease, let's treat when we, where we need uh, to deliver the energy. So that's one direction. We have quite a few programs uh, in this area, but I'm not gonna talk about them uh, here. They're a bit uh, early in stage and harder to describe. Uh, on the other side of it is to uh, improve the effectiveness of uh, energy delivery. Uh, Dr. Boulos uh, talked about uh, his experience with uh, Smart Touch. I'll, uh, since he's already talked about it a bit, I'll skip a few of the slides. And the other one, I'll talk about a program that is uh, early on trying to assess the lesion as it's being formed. 
And what you see here in the bottom is a cartoon kind of showing the temperature. It's actually not a cartoon, it's actual results of the temperature profile uh, under an ablation uh, catheter during ablation. And this is obviously dynamic. You see the temperature as it evolves. And so I'm going to talk about uh, these two. Smart Touch, as uh, indicated by uh, Dr. Boos, is already used uh, clinically. It's uh, C marked and approved in uh, Japan. Uh, over 20,000 procedures have been uh, done in the first uh, year since it was launched uh, last year. And 350 hospitals all reuse it uh, on a pretty regular basis. The other concept is the concept of lesion assessment that I'll talk about. So Dr. Boulos uh, showed this uh, catheter. I'll maybe uh, skip this, and there's a video clip that kind of describes uh, this. I hope that the, uh, video would, uh, uh, the video would work. Biosense Webster introduces the Thermocool Smart Touch Contact Force Sensing Catheter a new measure of success in complex cardiac ablation. The Thermocool Smart Touch catheter accurately measures contact force and direction by utilizing the CARTO-3 system's electromagnetic location technology, the standard of care for mapping accuracy. The location sensing technology has been miniaturized inside the tip of the Thermocool Smart Touch catheter. A location reference signal is transmitted from a coil in the tip electrode and monitored by location sensing coils, which detect micro movements of the tip in response to contact with cardiac tissue. The tip electrode is mounted on a precision spring, which provides consistent movement in response to contact force, enabling the precise calculation of force in grams. This information is displayed in real time on the CARTO-3 system's graphical user interface. The numeric display of force is shown in grams, while the direction of force is also indicated. The force magnitude and direction is also displayed as a vector on the catheter tip icon in the CARTO map. In addition, the force can be displayed in real time on the force graph. By providing precise contact force data in real time, Integrated with the CARTO-3 system display, the Thermocool Smart Touch catheter provides a new measure of success in complex cardiac ablation. So this is the Smart Touch uh, catheter. There's a lot of uh, reports similar to what uh, Dr. Bullis uh, shared with regards to improvement of uh, um, results. Obviously, this is still early on in the usage of this uh, product, so no randomized study have been conducted yet, so this is preliminary. But anecdotally, it seems like knowing whether you're in contact. And it's amazing how, uh, how non-trivial it is, because in many cases you think that you're in contact and you're actually not. You feel the friction, it's a friction of the catheter with the sheath, not the contact with the tissue. So it's amazing and very, very experienced users have uh, improved their technique and are improving it uh, as we speak based on information. Uh, they're getting this force information that in the past was uh, uh, not known. The next concept I'm going to speak about, and this is now uh, early on, we call it internally uh, Accublate. And this is trying to take all the pieces of information that could be available in the tip of a catheter. As you understand, this is, uh, um, once developed, going to be a very complicated catheter. All this is going to fit into a tip which is two millimeter in diameter. So in addition to the contact force, and it's clear that uh, having force information is critical, measuring impedance, uh, and having uh, microelectrodes that would measure both impedance and electrograms. And the idea is you take all these pieces of information, have a model of the tissue, and using the model, take all these pieces of information and simulate uh, the formation of the tissue. This is the tissue uh, uh, temperature profile within a tissue under a catheter. We have done this uh, so far in uh, vivo. Uh, both uh, on a thigh muscle model as well as in uh, vivo, in uh, uh, beating heart. And the initial results uh, are very uh, promising. Uh, what you see here are actual pictures of the cut, the histological cut. The borders of uh, the ablation are rather clear. And this is what the model has uh, predicted. And when you look at the results of the histology versus what we've modeled, it seems to be very, very consistent, very promising. In addition to that, uh, since we're measuring uh, the temperature at the hottest spot, the hottest spot is uh, very important and very critical because for people that do ablation, 
know that you can get steam pops. If the temperature there, the pressure gets too high, you get a steam pop, which uh, typically is linked to uh, um, complications which uh, you would like to avoid. And we have here another graph, again, from a series of uh, uh, animals where we clearly see this is the estimated hotspot temperature. There's a threshold that we put there. And as you see, once you cross the threshold, you start getting steam pops. And so this technology, not only being able to calculate uh, the temperature profile of a lesion, also able to provide an alert before a steam pop occurs. So these are the two technologies I wanted to uh, talk about. One of them is already in uh, pretty wide uh, clinical uh, use, not that yet in the US, but uh, we'll probably get to the US within a year. And the other one is still in early concept. Uh, both are, again, addressing uh, the question of how do we improve the generation of lesion and assessing the lesion as it's being formed. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention.